Hello, everyone. If you like what I'm doing here, please consider subscribing, liking, and commenting. It would really help the channel out quite a bit. Thank you very much. about a man named Will Crawford, imprisoned for a daring theft, which he did not commit. Can you imagine being confined to a cell for years, thrown in with thieves, felons, addicts, and dangerous criminals? What would you think about? How would you preserve your sanity? And what would you do if you were released? Will Crawford knew. Our mystery drama, The Corpse Wrote Shorthand, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Roy Windsor and stars Mandel Kramer. It is sponsored in part by Listerine Lozenges and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. False arrest. False imprisonment. Within ourselves, each of us, in imagination, can visualize just about anything that can happen to another person. We can dream about love because it has touched us, about hate because we have hated, about success, failure, hunger, and pain. But I, for one, cannot imagine being arrested and imprisoned for a crime I didn't commit. And that is what happened to one honest man named Will Crawford. You won't change your mind, Nick. I've explained, Mom. I've... Yes, you certainly have. All right, I'll, I'll drive up alone. I'll explain you couldn't take the day off. He'll understand. Gosh, you, you make me feel like I don't care. Do you? Care? Well, sure, it's just that... Well, I'm new at this job, and I don't like to have to ask for a day off to, to drive up there. It's not so bad up there, Nick. I've been going up once a week for five years. Oh, I know. I've been up, too. It's just... It's just what makes me feel funny. Why? Because it's a prison? Well, sure. But I understand. You, um... You will be here when we come home. Oh, sure. I... I wish you wouldn't make me feel this way, Mom. I'm not guilty of anything. Well, don't worry about it. It's, it's just that it's been so awful. Mom, you don't know what I went through. Kids in high school, boy, they can be pretty nasty. You'd think I'd stolen the money. My senior year just fell apart. You remember? Yes, I do. And I was heart sick when you left. So was your father. We hoped you'd go on to college instead. Mm-hmm. One lousy job after another. Couldn't get a decent one. I'd say I'm Nick Crawford, and that's it. You the son of the man who stole all that money from the Pendleton Bank? <laughs> well, I, I made a lot of loans. No one worried I'd steal their power mowers. Oh, Nick. You should have left River Falls and... Gone someplace else. Changed our name. Started fresh. <laughs> Nick, I, I must get ready. You still believe, don't you, Mom? I know your father. He's an honest man. He says he did not embezzle money from the Pendleton Bank. And I believe him. What happens now? I don't know. Mom, why don't we sell a house? Move away. And admit your father's guilt? Oh, gosh, he was found guilty. He was the bookkeeper. The books have been tampered with. Over a hundred thousand dollars is missing. And someone has it, but not your father. What's he gonna do when he comes home? He can't get a job in River Falls. Who who take a chance on him? I believe your father is innocent, Nick. That has given me the strength to hold my head up to all those customers who come into the variety store and buy odds and ends and give me pitying looks. I know you've been embarrassed by what happened to your father. So you you don't have to be here when I bring him home. No. I'll be here. To say hello and... Then I think I will clear out. I... I just can't go on living like this, Mom. I... I just can't. Well, Mr. Crawford.
Crawford, you're free. So I am. I'm glad to see you get out. Not that you ever gave me any trouble. That's not what I meant. I know. And if it thought I'd meet a man like you, I kind of miss you, Mr. Crawford. What's it been, uh, five years now? Commuted to five for good behavior. Uh-huh. What's going to do now? What would you do if you'd been sentenced to prison for a crime you didn't commit? Uh, you're still saying that, are you? It's true. Well, I'd like to believe you, but I don't know. I read up on a trial and how they proved you juggled your book. Someone juggled the book. I didn't. If you say so, Mr. Crawford. Let me ask you again. If you'd been sentenced to prison for a crime you didn't commit, what would you do? Uh, if I'd been given a bum rap and then got out, I'd go after the double crosser who committed the crime and wring the truth out of it. Mm-hmm. Guess what I'm going to do. Yeah. I can see it in your eyes. I don't care if it takes the rest of my life, Clancy. I didn't embezzle the money from the bank. I have never seen the hundred thousand dollars. I don't know where it is, where it went, but I'm going to find out. And when I do, yeah, I've been labeled a thief. I've been in prison for five years. Think of what this has done to my wife and to my son, how they've suffered. I can't give them back those five years of humiliation, but I can create a future for us. All I have to do is discover who framed me. Yeah. Good luck, Mr. Crawford. Thank you, Clancy. Uh, you know where the warden's off. Oh, sure. Sure, I'll see him and listen to his little speech. You uh, committed a crime against society for which you were tried and found guilty. You paid your debt. Now you're a free man again. Mm-hmm. Then he'll wish me good luck and give me some money. He's performed his job. Next case. Doesn't make any difference whether the person was guilty or innocent. The warden makes the same speech. It's like dealing with a machine. It performs a function, but it has no judgment, no heart. Just punches you in or out. But he's not a bad guy, Mr. Crawford. I know that. He's just a cipher in our equation of justice. Goodbye, Clancy. So long, Mr. Crawford. If I sound bitter, it's because I am. I've been robbed of five years of my life. I can't get them back. But somebody's going to pay for it. Starting now. <laughs> Oh, well. oh, no. Oh, come on, Stella. Hey, that's I can't help it. You'll get us thrown out of this place. It, it, it's just that I... I cannot believe you're free. I'm not, darling. What? Now, don't look frightened, Stella. You just dry your eyes and listen to me. Let me try and explain. Oh, of course. First, I thank God for you. Oh, well. No, let me finish. I do thank God for a wife like you. I know what you've gone through, like... I paced that cell every day for five years, knowing what life was like for you here in River Falls. Having to work and meet the self-righteous hypocrites who were curious about poor Mrs. Crawford, how she could hold her head up after her husband was sent to prison for embezzling a hundred thousand dollars from the bank. I know, darling, I know the embarrassment and the hurt, and still you believed in me. You're the only one who did. Does. Does. Thank you, darling. Well, you, you'll have me crying again. No, 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 no. No more crying, Stella. <laughs> I didn't make that speech to make you cry. I just wanted to say thank you. Except to you and Nick and what I've done to both of you. I wouldn't have cared if I'd run to death in that prison. But I love you and I care deeply about both of you. <laughs> From this day on, I have one goal in my life. I'm going to prove my innocence. I'd rather be dead. Well, don't I mean it. I'd rather be dead than be marked for the rest of my life as a thief. I didn't embezzle that money. I know that. Don't dwell on it, though. You're free. We're together. That's what counts. That's what's important. And that's not enough for me, or for you, or Nick. We've talked all this out before. I know we have. I know it. And? How? I don't quite know. How? I know in my heart that you didn't embezzle that money because I know you. But how do we prove it? Somebody took the money. Who? Five years ago. Old Mr. Pendleton's retired. His son is the president now. It's a long time ago, an age. I thought about it night after lonely night. Poor darling. Married to a fall guy. Honest Will Crawford set up for a fall right into a prison cell. I could kill the swine who did this to us. But I'm going to find him still. I'll find him when I do. Will. Really? Let's talk sense. I am talking sense. No, you're not. Both of us are angry. Let's, let's just look at the facts coldly. You were accused and tried 
and convicted by a jury. Yes, because some securities were found to be missing and because someone had made false entries in my books. You didn't embezzle that money. But how was it done? Now think. Well, there are two ways, at least. What about the security? Adam Asano. The contractor? That's right. Asano borrowed $70,000 from the bank and gave us securities as collateral. About $90,000 worth. Mm-hmm. When he paid off his loan, he wanted his securities returned. They were missing. They'd been sold. They were traced to a brokerage house in New York, but the seller couldn't be found. You wrote that check for $70,000. That's right. And I placed the securities in the safe. And when the investigation began, the auditor also found that your books were overdrawn by almost $10,000. I can't deny that still. Well, what happened? I mean, what do you think happened? Someone, some officer probably, stole the securities. But then what about your overdrawn books? Still, let me give you an example of embezzlement. Now, a teller can enter a deposit and put the money in his pocket, but nothing as large as $10,000. Now, it must have been a series of false entries. Well, how would that work? Well, look, let's say somebody mails in his paycheck for, say, $200 for deposit. Mm -hmm. Now, that amount is entered in that person's account. The clerk reports the deposit to me, and I enter it in my books. However, the clerk does not stamp the check for deposit. He or she steals the check and either cashes it or deposits it in a secret account in some other bank. That bank cancels the check and returns it to the depositor's employer. But what about what about the endorsement? A stamp and a number. Both look official and hardly ever would be challenged. That's, that's ingenious, Will. And how could a scheme like that ever be traced? Well, offhand, I don't know. Both the securities and the cash have vanished. <sighs> that's just futile. No, it's not, darling. Well, how do you begin? Very carefully. What do you mean by that? Still, someone worked this frame up on me. Maybe more than one person. I'm going to ask questions. I'll pick up a a stray remark here, another there, and in time, I'll put them together, and I'll have an indication of who is behind the embezzlement. Then I'll investigate. Oh, well, it it seems so hopeless. Well, when I was in prison, I read something that stuck in my mind. Forget where I read it or who wrote it, and it's just a line, but what it is is, in a really just cause, the weak conquer the strong. I believe that still. It may take a long time, but I'll get the truth. Those lines from Shakespeare's Othello come to mind. Who steals my purse steals trash. Tis something nothing. T'was mine, tis his, and has been slaved a thousand. But he that filches from me my good name robs me of that which not enriches him and makes me poor indeed. Will Crawford's sentiment exactly. I'll return shortly with Act Two, and then we will find out if the former bookkeeper can exonerate himself. The title of our play, The Corpse Wrote Shorthand, a provocative title. What in the world can it mean? Will Crawford was in prison for embezzlement. Then what's this about a corpse? And how in heaven's name could a corpse write shorthand? Well, an honest story should have an honest title. Let's find out just what this title means. Good morning, Mr. Pendleton. Ah, Crawford. Thank you for seeing me. Yes, sir. I must say I'm surprised by your visit. My father I tried to visit him, but he refused to talk to me, so I'm grateful to you for these few minutes. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Now, sit down. I haven't much time. Thank you. I came home last night. Yes. There was a script in the forum yesterday that you had been released. What brings you to me, Crawford? I should think it would be embarrassing for you to walk into the bank. Not at all. I spent many productive years in the bank as your bookkeeper, and I have nothing to be embarrassed about. You don't? No. I didn't embezzle that money. 
I'm a forgiving man, Crawford, but I am not stupid. And arrogance makes me angry. You made a mistake and just paid for it. I'm willing to forget the damage you did to the bank's reputation. But when you declare bluntly that you did not embezzle, you sound demented. I'm telling the truth. You were arrested, tried, and convicted. How dare you waste my time in saying that you're innocent? Now, if you'll excuse if me, I will... If I sold those stolen securities and juggled my books for $10,000, where is it, Mr. Pendleton? Where is the $100,000? Oh, so that's your game. The money will turn up. Oh, not here, not in River Falls. Now that you've been freed, you'll leave town. But wherever you go, you'll be watched. And the money will be recovered. I'm not leaving River Falls. Then you're going to starve to death. Just what do you propose to do, Crawford? I have some ideas. But I was the victim of a clever scheme. Some person or persons framed me, and I'll find out who they were. You astonish me. Please, leave. And don't come back. One question. What happened to Doris Conroy? Who? The assistant bookkeeper. She's no longer with the bank. Doris Conroy. I don't really remember her. Well, that's surprising. I beg your pardon? When you were second vice president, you worked with her a lot. A rather pretty girl, dark haired, nice skin. You were the loan officer at the time. Oh, that girl. Yes, yes, I remember her. What about her? Well, I'd just like to talk to her, that's all. She was my assistant. I have no idea what happened to her. When did she leave the bank? I don't know. Ask Mr. Baker and personnel. He'll tell you. All right, I will. Thank you for your time, Mr. Pendleton. Good morning. Hello, Will. Hi, Tim. Hey, I really appreciate it. Hey, what... don't thank me. Still news. There may be a story in it for me. That's my business. I, uh, I dug up the information you wanted. You know where I can find Doris Conroy? Yeah. Uh, but it won't do you any good. He's dead. Oh. oh. I didn't know. I'm sorry. Yeah. Two years ago. She left New York on a cruise for the Caribbean. They found her body in the Hudson. She fell overboard. That's the story. <laughs> the personnel man at the bank, Mr. Baker, said that she left the Pendleton Bank just about two years ago. Uh, what's important to you about Doris Conroy? Well, she was my assistant at the bank, for one thing. For another, why, why would she quit her job? And for a third, I'm surprised that she could afford to go on a cruise. Uh, huh? You sound skeptical. Well, maybe a little. Why? Look at it this way, Will. Everyone's convinced you embezzled the money. Okay, you say you didn't, but are you sure you aren't trying to create a mystery where there isn't one? Doris Conroy saves her money, quits her job, goes on a cruise. She falls overboard, she's drowned. A tragedy, but it's uh, a natural one. <laughs> Maybe she had too many drinks. Doris didn't drink. Oh? I forget about Doris Conroy. I guess you'll have to at that, unless you can communicate with her in the grave in Rose Hill Cemetery in Oakton. Yes, that's where she was from, Oakton. I wonder if her mother's still alive. Well, that's easy to find out. No, wait, Tim, hold it. I'm going to drive up and talk to her. Well, unless her mother's dead, too. Oh, I couldn't be that unlucky. Uh, the mother's name is Mrs. Fred Conroy, 800 Hillside Drive. Hillside Drive. That's a pretty fancy address. <laughs> the best. Hmm. What's that mean? Hey, pal, what are you thinking? Oh, I'll, I'll tell you later. Just a little idea, that's all. Uh, Mr. Pendleton in River Falls told me that I... Oh, could... yes. He's such a considerate man. Uh, you come in. Thank you. A week can talk in the living room. I'm alone here. I don't get to sit in here very much. Oh, it's a lovely room. Oh, such a considerate man, Mr. Pendleton. A gentleman. So nice of him to send you out. Oh, he must think my mind is slipping. I do wonder once in a while... So considerate to warn me. I, I, I am forgetful. Oh, we all are from time to time. Oh, ain't that the truth? Oh, Mr. Pendleton said if that embezzler called on me, I wanted to talk to him. I see. He said he's crazy. Oh, I guess he is. Oh, he's crazy, all right. Says he never stole the money. He got out of prison and now he's trying to stir up trouble. Is that right? 
Is that why Mr. Pendleton sent you out to see me? He's trying to stir up trouble, all right. Oh, I've had my share of trouble. I know you have. Your poor daughter. She got down. Yes, I, I remember. I was awfully sorry to hear about that, Mr. Why Conroy. Why didn't Mabel look after her? Uh, yes, Mabel. Well, I, I really don't know. Mabel was all broken up. Yes. Mabel. Mabel, I, I, I can't seem to remember Mabel's last name. Scully. <laughs> now, how's that for remembering? Oh, every once in a while, my thinking has his on straight. Mabel Scully, of course, of course. Do you ever see her, Mrs. Gannon? Oh, well, she sends me a Christmas card every Christmas. I, I never see her, no. I see. Does she still live in Oakton? Oh, darling, is dead. She fell off that boat. Yes, we're all still very sad about that, including Mabel Scully. Oh, it upsets me to talk about those. I understand. Well, I'll be on my way. This is such a nice room. Doris liked this room. She had her friends over, and they liked it very much. Mabel liked it, too. Hello, darling. Oh, we are. Did it get My faithful, trusting wife. <laughs> something. We haven't got much, but we've got each other. That's enough for me. Nick not home? No. But don't worry about it, darling. Uh, I understand. He telephoned that he'd be late. I see. Well, so do I. And I can't blame him. I'm an embarrassment to him. You know, this is going to get worse before it gets better still. Now, what do you mean by that? Well, I imagine that Tim Yeager at the forum will have a story about me in tomorrow's paper. Then he was willing to see you. Oh, I'm glad. He's a nice man. Well, he's got an open mind. That's why he's a good reporter. I don't know what he'll write, but I, I'm sure that it'll stir up trouble. You know the kind of thing. Crawford still insists he's innocent. People at the store will look at you and know we're both loose in the top story. Oh, I'm used to that. Forget it. Well, how was Tim helpful? Okay. From the beginning. I saw C. Palmer Pendleton. He let you come in? Yep. When I showed up at the bank, I caused a big stir. Most of the persons I worked with are still there, and they looked at me as if they'd seen a ghost. Was it awful? Well, it wasn't easy, darling. Some of them talked to me as if I was contagious. One or two just buried their heads in their work and ignored me, but my arrival was disruptive. That's why Pendleton saw me. And he was his old sanctimonious self. Suggested that we leave River Falls. He'd have an eye on us, of course, to catch me with the money that I've got stashed away somewhere. Mm, that cheap hypocrite. All of that, darling. When I told him I was staying right here in River Falls, he got red in the face, told me flatly I'd never be employed again. Now, I asked him about Doris Conroy. Oh, she, she drowned, Will. Yes, I know that now, but I didn't until Tim told me. Well, I'm sure I must have told you. Well, maybe you did, but I guess I, I, I didn't remember. Maybe I'd forgotten. If I didn't know, it didn't mean anything to me at the time, and now it does. Why? First, I learned that Doris had left the bank two years ago. Mm -hmm. Then, from Tim, I learned that at the same time, she booked a cruise to the Caribbean. Now, the night of the sailing, she fell overboard. And next morning, her body was found floating in the Hudson. Floating, Stell. Keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Now, I wanted to find out more about what happened to Doris, so I went to see her mother in Oakton. And you wouldn't believe it. Well, go on. She thought Pendleton had sent me from the bank to make sure that she didn't admit Will Crawford to her house. Now, he must have telephoned her after I left his office. She's so addle-minded, poor thing, that she thought I'd come out to reaffirm his advice. Well, now, why would Pendleton warn her against you? I wondered about that, too. Does the old lady know something that I shouldn't find out? The answer is no, but, and this is a very big but, she lives elegantly on Hillside Drive in a very fine house. Now, how can she afford it? The answer is that Doris could afford it. And with Doris dead, Mrs. Conroy has come into Doris's money. Because the setup just doesn't ring true. Then, then you think that Doris somehow was mixed up in the embezzlement? That's my theory. Now I mean to pursue it. But how? I mean, with Doris dead and her mother... Well, that all depends upon what happens tomorrow. Tomorrow. Doris wasn't alone on that boat. She was taking the cruise with a friend of hers. Now, I dragged the name out of Mrs. Conroy. Doris's friend was Mabel Scully. She lives in Oakton, and Tim's going to see her tomorrow. Well, what can you learn from her? Well, I don't know offhand. But if you get a person talking after the fact, things come out. 
At the time of the drowning, I'm sure Mabel was hysterical. The ship had left port and was sailing out to sea. Well, where was Doris? I mean, I, I can just imagine the confusion on shipboard, because it wasn't until the next morning that the tragedy was discovered. Then it must have been his hysteria. Yes, of course. Oh, what a frightful experience for Mabel Scully. Then she probably was questioned and browbeaten and then finally released. Now, that's two years ago. The hysteria of that moment has passed. Two years have gone by. Now, perhaps, Mabel Scully will be able to reconstruct what happened the night Doris Conroy drowned. Which she didn't. What? She didn't, Stell. Because if she had, her body would have sunk to the bottom of the Hudson and have been swept out to sea. <laughs> Now that we've established a corpse, what about that shorthand? A curious story indeed. A man is judged innocent until he is proven guilty, and here is a man proven guilty who is innocent. How can that happen in these wonderful days of law and order? Read the newspapers. On a quite regular basis, I read about persons being released from prisons who are innocent when imprisoned. Laws like cobwebs entangle the weak, but are broken by the strong, as Will Crawford is about to prove. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. One man's innocence simply must be another man's guilt. If Will Crawford did not embezzle $50,000 from the Pendleton Bank, who did? He was found guilty and imprisoned for five years. And the money still hasn't been found. And he insists he is innocent. Well, we have a corpse on our hands, one that writes shorthand. Is that the clue Mr. Crawford needs to understand before he proves his innocence? His reporter friend Tim is going to try. Thanks for seeing me, Miss Scully. Oh, that's all right. Uh, please sit down. You're Mr. Uh, uh, Yeager? Right. Uh, scandal monger supreme for the River Falls Forum, though uh, most of our scandal's pretty much of a yarn. <laughs> nice place you have here. Oh, it's all right. I got the stuff with the settlement. Ah. And took back your maiden name. You didn't ask to see me to talk about me, Mr. Yeager. Uh, it's almost six and I'm being picked up in half an hour. Oh, uh, sorry. Miss Scully, a man has just been released from prison after serving five years for embezzlement. Yeah, Will Crawford. Right. I read your story in this afternoon's paper. Claims his innocence. <laughs> no way. He's trying to find a way, and I'm inclined to go along with him. Now, that's where you enter the picture. Me? Yeah. You and Doris Conroy. Oh, Doris. Oh, yes, that was horrible. Yeah, I can imagine. That ship was halfway down the Hudson, and I was still looking for Doris. It wasn't until the next morning that we found out. They found her body floating in the Hudson. She drowned. Yeah, that's what they said at the time. Well, that's what happened. I wonder. Apparently, she fell overboard, her head hit something, and she drowned. That's right. Of course, uh, drowned isn't quite right. Oh? Now, she died from that smash on the head. There was no water in her lungs. If there had been... She might have been swept out to sea. Oh, it's so ugly even to think about. Yeah. Could become uglier still. What does that mean? Well, let me come to that in a moment. I'm here because I hope you'll reconstruct that night for me. Well, there's very little to tell. Now, you and Doris have been friends for a long time, right? We knew each other since high school. She went to business school and got a job in River Falls at the Pendleton Bank, and I attended junior college. I went to work here in Oakton in the offices of Hometown Insurance. <laughs> I'm still there. And you went on the cruise two years ago, is that right? Yes. And Doris quit her job at the same time, right? Huh? Yes, she did. I never knew why. I asked her, of course, but all she'd say was that she was tired of being an assistant bookkeeper. And she had plenty of money? Well, I don't know about that. I mean, but she must have. For years, Doris and her mother lived in a four-room flat above a grocery store. Then they bought that place on Hillside. Oh, well, that's a really fancy residential area. Those houses cost a lot. Yeah. Did Mrs. Conroy have money? Oh, no. No, no. She worked in a dress shop. Mr. Conroy died about four years ago, but... Oh, I can't imagine him leaving a bundle of insurance. So, how did Doris and her mother move into such a fine house? Where'd the money come from? Well, I don't know. 
And two years later, Doris quits a job, goes on a cruise. And you got to admit it, it's all pretty strange. Well, I, I know it is. Yeah, you know, I think about it often. Oh, then it goes out of my head. I, I don't like to dwell on what happened. What did happen, Miss Scully? I mean, looking back now, calmly, what do you remember about that night on the ship? For instance, what do you remember about the cabin? Oh, it was lovely. Had both of you unpacked? Oh, no. No, no. We left our bags and went right up on deck to watch the ship sail. Uh, had friends come to see you off the old uh, bon voyage party? Oh, just the man I made the mistake of marrying. Adora stayed out of the way. Oh, she said hello to him, but then she sort of drifted off. That's the last I heard of her. And no one came to see her off? No. Her boss expected to, but he was in Providence. He sent a telegram. I, I gave it to the police. No. Yeah. Now, you also turned over to them the teeth pack watch with the engraving on it. Yes, that's right. Oh, boy, that watch must have cost a fortune. On the back it said, With Gratitude, Charlie. Oh, yeah? Uh, who was Charlie? Search me. I saw that watch uh, that night for the first time. I don't know what Doris did for him, but that watch was a lot of gratitude. Mm, so much gratitude, I'm a little suspicious of it. What do you mean? Well, had Doris become engaged to some rich guy? No. No, she didn't go with anyone. And still, someone gives her a watch that probably costs, to, what, $800? Now, what does that suggest to you, Miss Scully? I... Oh, I... I can't believe it. I can. Blackmail. <laughs> I'll get it, Estelle. That might be Tim Yeager. All right. Any luck? Yeah, plenty, I think. Come on in. I'll buy you a drink. Estelle, I'm fixing drinks. One for you, too. Maybe we've got something to celebrate. Hello, Tim. Do you have any news? Yeah, yeah. I better tell you, it's a mixed bag. Oh, please, sit down. We're very grateful for you, Tim, for taking such an interest in Will's case. Who? I'm happy I did. Now I know he's an innocent man. Oh, Tim. Why all this wasn't gone into at the time of her death, I, I don't know. Somebody should have seen the connection. Well, wait a minute. You've lost it. Here you go, darling. Oh, thank you. Tim? Tim is just saying... Why didn't anyone see the connection between Doris Conroy's mysterious death and the embezzlement charge against you, Will? Wait a minute. Now, wait now. Slow down. What is the connection? Well, there are several. First, about four years ago, Doris and her mother moved from a dump over a grocery store to Hillside Drive. That means money, all right? Second, Doris quits her job just at the time she decides to go on a cruise. Third... There's a bon voyage message from Providence in her stateroom from her boss, C. Palmer Pendleton. Hey, hold it. I, I, I got it. I got the, the watch. What watch? What are you talking about? It's the $800 tea but that somebody named Charlie gave to her and engraved with gratitude. That's it. Charlie. Judge Charlie is a C in C. Palmer Pendleton. Then it was Pendleton and Doris Conroy who embezzled the money and set me up for the ball guy. I, I never would have dreamed. Pendleton and Doris, of course. I am going to pin this on that sanctimonious moneylender and send him up the river for a really long stretch. Oh, I want that more than anything in life, Tim. But how are we going to do it? You're saying that he murdered Doris Conroy. But why would he do that? From my great stockpile of cliches, how about this one? Thieves fall out. And so the blackmailers. Pendleton split with Doris. Then she wanted more. He could stand just so much pressure and danger. He killed her and made it seem like accidental drowning, which it wasn't. That smash on her head was not made by something she hit when she fell into that filthy dockside water. Pendleton hit her with something and dumped her over the side. All right. But the telegram indicates that he was in Providence. Yeah, I know it will. Well, that's the stickler. Well, let me dig into it. The forum's got all kinds of connections. I'll go after the telegram company first thing in the morning. Uh, and what you might do, Will, is to go to New York... Trace that teapot to the jeweler, uh, show him a picture of Pendleton, ask him if Pendleton's the guy who bought it. Right. And Estelle. Mm hmm. Not a word about this to anyone. We don't want our bird to fly the coop. So, y yes? Oh, is it, 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 it Mr. Willie from the bank? Hello, Mrs. Conroy. May we come in? Who is that? This is Mr. Yeager from the River Falls Forum. From the newspaper? Yes. Oh, well, what do you know? Oh, please, come in. Oh, isn't this nice, Mr. Will? Miss Conroy, I'm afraid we have some bad news for you about your daughter, Doris. Oh, she's dead. She fell off a boat. Yes. 
and we think that maybe it wasn't an accident, and we're investigating her death. Oh, Mr. Pendleton has always been so considerate. Well, the police now suspect that maybe somebody pushed her over the side of the boat. Doris was a good swimmer. We think that Doris had an enemy and knew it. Well, maybe so. I wonder if Doris left anything behind her about this this enemy of hers. Have you kept all of her things, Mrs. Conroy? Her room is just the way it was when she was away two years ago. Could we, uh, see the room? Bell! Estelle, come quickly. Good heavens, what is it? We've got her diary. Uh, Estelle, Will says you read shorthand. Can you make some sense out of this for us? A di- who, whose diary? Doris Conroy's. It's a five-year diary going back to 1970. Now, maybe someplace in this thing there's a clue to her relationship with Pendleton. If there is, we've got the factual proof to reopen my case. Yeah, and we've got to hurry, Estelle. Mrs. Conroy just may take it into her head to telephone Pendleton. We don't want him to skip. We want to confront him. Well, I, I, I do my best, but my shorthand is awfully rusty. She has a lot in this diary. Well, you just do the best you can. I'll yeah. telephone Providence. Maybe the paper up there has found out what I want to know about the telegram. Mark? Uh, hey, hello, uh, Tim Yeager in River Falls. Any luck? Oh, where'd you locate him? Doing graduate work, I see. Yeah, now he, he admitted sending the telegram? Oh, why did he send it? I get it. Yeah. Yeah, I think this just about says it up. I, I, I'm very grateful to you, Mark, and to the newspaper. Uh, I'll, I'll telephone you tomorrow morning, okay? Yeah. Goodbye. Uh, any luck, Tim? We have got Mr. Pendleton by the throat. Well, great. It's here, Will. I, I, I found it. What? In black and white. That's here, Estelle. The, the entry was dated March 1970. Dear diary, after work today, I had cocktails with Mr. Pendleton at... The pub. Mm-hmm. I like him. He's such a considerate man. I almost fainted when he told me about a plan he's been thinking about. I listened with a great deal of interest because there's money in it for me. More money than I can imagine, dear Gary. Mm. He's an officer in the bank, so he knows just how to put his plan into effect, but he needs someone he can trust to work with him, and I am it. We can get our hands on at least one hundred thousand dollars, and the bookkeeper Will Crawford won't be able to suspect a thing. Big day for you, Will. Thanks to you, Tim. Ah, uh, just another story to me. Well, if you haven't believed in me, uh, let's go. Go get you the high sign. Now, you do the talking. It's your story. Good morning, Mr. Pendleton. But I, I was told Mr. Yeager of the Forum asked to see me. Yes, I'm Yeager. Well, what's this jailbird doing with you? He wants to witness and record your admissions, Mr. Pendleton. What? Get out of here. If you don't, I'll have security arrest you. There'll be an I... arrest, all right. But it'll be yours for embezzling $100,000 from your father's bank and for murdering Doris Conroy because she blackmailed you. You're insane. You and Doris stole the money and made me the fall guy. Two years ago, she put the bite on you for more money, left her job and planned a cruise. You hit her on the head and threw her overboard. That's a lie. It's not a lie. You sent her a telegram from Providence. How could I murder someone in New York? No good, Mr. Pendleton. Your telephone to your son, a student in Providence, dictated the telegram to him and he sent it for you. Both the newspaper and the police have checked that out. Then you left River Falls and went to New York. You met Doris on shipboard, murdered her, and threw her overboard. And you're that Charlie whose name was engraved on the back of that peepit wash along with ingratitude. You gave it to Doris. The jeweler identified you from a picture. You proved those charges. The embezzling scheme and Doris's decision to demand more money from you two years ago, both are written down in shorthand in her diary. Mr. Pendleton, the River Falls police are waiting outside for you. I denied the embezzlement charges against me, Mr. Pendleton, but I was jailed for five years. The charges against you can't be denied. They're based on facts. The murder charge is based on circumstantial evidence. By that statement, you just hung yourself. You've admitted that there is a murder charge. Tim, ask the police to come in. An ancient Roman writer named Juvenal asked, 
What man was ever content with one crime? Mr. Pendleton and Doris Conroy connived to embezzle a fortune. She was not content with her share, so she resorted to blackmail, and she was murdered. Many crimes are detected. Persons are prosecuted for them, but when an innocent person is charged and sentenced, justice has miscarried. But an innocent person, given time and courage, very often can clear his name, as we have seen. I'll be back shortly. Modern justice dates back to the year 1215, when the Magna Carta guaranteed that no subject should be kept in prison without trial and judgment by his peers. The Western world has lived by that precept for almost 800 years. Sometimes justice may be unjust or slow, but in the long run, it is not only the sum of all moral duty. It is also what makes each of us equal. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Joan Lovejoy, Russell Horton, Joan Shea, and Barry Kroger. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown.